This is Kenji Fuji from Chiba Institute of Technology speaking. This is a presentation of the ninth European workshop on the seismic behavior of irregular and complex structures. This time, I would like to make a presentation entitled Evaluating the Effect of the Directivity of Bidirectional Ground Motion on an Irregular Building, the former Uto City Hall. So, let me start from introduction. The former Uto City Hall, shown in this photo, was severely damaged in 2016 Kumamoto earthquake. The seismic capacity of this building evaluated in the previous study was insufficient to withstand the foreshock. However, there remain some problems. One of the problems is that the effect of directivity may not be negligible. The epicentral distance of the foreshock was 15 km, while in the previous study, the effect of directivity was not considered for the seismic capacity evaluation. So, how to understand the effect of directivity in the nonlinear response? It is difficult. In my opinion, it needs to consider the change of the mode shape in nonlinear range. In this presentation, the nonlinear response of the former Uto City Hall is analyzed considering various directions of seismic input. Then, the nonlinear first model response is calculated for each result. This is done based on the pushover analysis results considering the change of the first mode shape. Based on the results, the directivity effect of the, in the local response is compared to that of the first mode response, and the maximum momentary input energy of the first model response is also discussed for the seismic intensity measurement. Next, let us move to the building and ground motion data. These figures shown here are structural plan and elevation of this building. As you see, the structural plan of this building is irregular. This building consists of two blocks, the office block and the steel block. All structural walls are in the steel block. This is the elevation of frame B1. This building is a five-story building. The present nonlinear analysis uses one of the three-dimensional frame structure models constructed in the previous study. In this study, the seismic input for the nonlinear time history analysis is the recorded acceleration of the foreshock at Knet Uto Station, which is the nearest station of the Uto City Hall. Here shows the two horizontal components. Next, we will proceed the nonlinear time history analysis. At first, I will explain the analysis cases. The two components are scaled by the same constant lambda. In this study, the constant lambda is set to be 0 0.8, 0 0.9, and 1.0. To investigate the effect of directivity, 24 cases are considered for the direction of the seismic input. The angle of incidence psi is set from 0 to 345 degrees clockwise from x-axis. It should be mentioned that the actual EW axis is approximately 45 degrees counterclockwise from x-axis. Therefore, the case psi equals 315 degrees is considered as the actual case in this study. So, let us move to the analysis results. What I am showing to you is the peak interstory drift at cramps in case of psi equals 315 degrees. In this study, this case is considered as the actual case. 
here is a column A1B1, column A3B1, and column A3B3. As shown here, the peak response of the flexible side column are larger than that of column A3B3. Besides, the drift of these clams exceeds 1 over 75 when lambda equals 0 0.9 and 1.0. Next, the distribution of the yielding hinges at frame B1, the flexible side, is shown here. As you see, three flexible yielding hinges are made at this node in case lambda equals 0 0.9 and 1.0. This is consistent to the actual damage observed after main shock. This analysis result suggests that the former Uto City Hall may have suffered some level of structural damage during the foreshock. Then I would like to discuss the effect of directivity of the seismic input to the peak local response. What I'm showing to you is the the peak response of the three columns. As you see, the peak response of column A1, B1, A3, B1 are larger in this direction. In contrast, the peak response of column A3, B3 is larger in the different direction. So next, the evaluation of the effect of directivity on the peak drift. First, the properties of the first model response are introduced. The properties of the frame model in the first mode are shown here. The displacement and restoring force vectors shown here are determined from the pushover analysis results. The properties of the equivalent single degree of freedom model are shown here. The equivalent displacement and acceleration and the effective model mass are calculated from the pushover analysis results. From the nonlinear time history analysis results, the nonlinear first model response is calculated according to this flow. First, the pushover analysis is carried out. Next, the first mode vector and effective mass are initialized. The effect at equivalent displacement is calculated based on the assumed properties. Then the peak value is found. Next, the first mode vector corresponding to the peak value is determined from the pushover analysis. Here, we will check whether the assumed properties are proper. If not, update the properties and going back for the calculation of equivalent displacement. If it is OK, calculate equivalent acceleration. So I would like to compare the variation of the peak response of the column and the peak equivalent displacement of the first model response. The peak equivalent displacement of the first model response are larger in this direction. This corresponds to the variation of column A1B1 and A3B1. This implies that the variation of response of columns at flexible side due to the direction of seismic input may be explained from the of the first model response. Next, I would like to discuss the momentary energy input. The moment the input energy of the first model response per unit mass is defined by this equation. This is calculated by integrating during a half cycle of structural response. Then the equivalent velocity of the maximum momentary input energy of the first model response is defined by this equation. Here shows the demonstration of the relation of the momentary input energy and peak displacement. The left figure shows the hysteresis response of the first model response. Its peak response occurs at the end of this half cycle shown as this red curve. Next, the right figure shows 
the time history of the momentary energy input. During the half cycle, when the peak response occurs, the maximum momentary input energy input occurs. Finally, the equivalent velocity of the maximum momentary input energy is compared to the linear spectrum. These linear V delta E spectra are obtained by rotating horizontal axis. And the response period of the nonlinear first model response T dash is defined from the time for the half cycle of the structural response. As you see, most of the plots are within the band of the maximum and minimum linear spectra. Therefore, for the conservative prediction, the maximum V delta E spectrum may be used. So, I would like to finalize my presentation. The first conclusion is the angle of incidence where the peak drift at flexible side cram is the largest is close to that where the peak equivalent displacement of the first mode is the largest. The second conclusion is the equivalent velocity of the maximum momentary input energy of the first model response agrees well with the linear elastic momentary input energy spectrum. This is the end of my presentation. Thank you very much.